John Terry or Rio Ferdinand? <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. You know what? They're, they're two totally different players. Ledley, no sitting, no sitting <laughs> on the fence. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in both in East London, so I really understand Tottenham as an area. I understand what the young kids feel like growing up in, the, in that kind of area. Sometimes feeling that nothing good happens to you when you're from a certain area. Travelled with a team to Liverpool to watch the game. Yeah. And Harry's pulled me an hour and a half before kickoff and said, Can you play? So <laughs> what? So oh, Harry, I can't. It was tough. It was tough because you know I had, I had a major operation at 26, and it was really after that my, never, my knee never felt the same. I tell you what, I see, I see some player with unbelievable ability. You're right. It has been difficult for him this season, and I think. I think it started in pre-season. You know, I think in pre-season he picked up an injury. He, he found the pace of the Premier League or the pace of of English football, the training, totally different to what he was used to in France. You know, people said that he was harsh when he sacked Martin Yol, or he was harsh when he sacked Harry Redknapp, harsh when he sacked Pochettino. But every decision has been made to try and win things. listeners and welcome back to yet again another episode of the beautiful game podcast as always i'm your host budge joined by my faithful two co-conspirators dot and dej boys how are we doing this fine evening i'm good budge man two premier league center back legends back to back so <laughs> <laughs> I'm to get this 100% how about you dej how are you feeling yeah, I'm good. Been looking forward to this one. Obviously, we've been having some pleasantries with Ledley. I know he loved last week's ep as well, so this one's going to be fun. 100%. We're looking forward to it. And of course, we've got to give Ledley his flowers. He, he's flowers. a man that absolutely <laughs> deserves it. He is a, a true captain, leader and legend after all. Uh, a one-club man through and through. And in a career which spanned 14 years in the Premier League, He made uh, 323 appearances for Spurs, scoring 14 goals. And of course, staying true and faithful to his club, as you can see, he's he's a (laughs) in the key. Um, Hiding at the badge. (laughs) (laughs) He continues to uh, represent Tottenham um, Hotspur as an ambassador. In uh, 2009, he was named by the Times as Tottenham's 25th best player of all time. And he's widely regarded by players, pundits and fans alike as one of the greatest defenders to ever grace the Premier League. He's, of course, previously drawn comparisons to uh, West Ham and England legend Bobby Moore, who, of course, captained the England team who lifted the World Cup in 66. Um, Just a few quotes from from some of the managers that he's worked uh, with uh, previously, Uh, starting off with uh, Harry Redknapp, who called him an absolute freak of nature. Uh, (laughs) Waddle said a class act a fabulous defender who sees the danger so, so well. And, and, and to round things off, Martin Yol uh, says, you're the best defender, central defender he's ever seen. Wow. So without further ado, we welcome Ledley King to the platform. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah, welcome Legend. Ledley. Cheers, guys. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no problem. Um, just to kick things off, um, <laughs> obviously Tottenham have been doing a lot of work for the NHS. Um, Tottenham were the first Premier League club to open up their stadium for NHS use. Um, we've seen Jose Mourinho delivering um, food to the local food banks. So just give us an overview as to what Tottenham have been doing during this pandemic. I think that what I'm proud of is that the club have always been, um, you know, the forefront of, of, of producing good work within the community. And, uh, you know, this is a, an important time at the moment. Uh, you know, a lot of people out there needing needing help of the club, and the, and, the, and the club have put themselves forward. And as you say, you know, the first club to kind of open up their stadium uh, in these hard times, and you know, really try and help the NHS. Um, you know, the underground car park at the moment is being is being used as a drive drive through for yeah. testing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a maternity ward for you know to try and. De- get people away from the, the 
you know, pregnant people, pregnant women, sorry, away from the, the hospital and, uh, you know, into the stadium where they're, you know, their, their safety is so important at the moment. And, and uh, <clears throat> you know, there's just various things that we're, we're trying to do. You know, you, you said Jose Mourinho is out there delivering food, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's something that's important to the people in the community, especially the ones that are, you know, most in need of that. Um, you know, players are, are doing their part as well. Players and former players are, uh, you know, sp speaking to people on, on the phone, making phone calls to, to uh, some of our elderly supporters, uh, you know, on, for their birthdays and, and uh, you know, and supporting the NHS in any way we can. You know, it was, again, it was the first, you know, a club that eliminated the stadium uh, mm -hmm. for the campaign of, of, of for our carers. And, you know, there's so many little things that the club are doing, which is, which is great. And sometimes they go unnoticed, but, uh, you know, I, I think as a club, as I say, we've always been, been uh, you know, the forefront of trying to do the most that we can do for the community. Yeah, so what is it about the community that Tottenham, you know, love to get involved with? I remember last season there was the BCOMS initiative with Leon Mann where yeah. lots of young people were invited to the stadium mm. and they were interviewing Harry Kane. Mm. So what is it about the community that Tottenham Hotspur at a club hold, you know, so fondly? Yeah, I think, you know, we, uh, the, the name of the football club is, you know, is, is the area. It's, it's an area within itself, you know, Tottenham and... You know, we, we, we take pride in, in trying to make, um, you know, the best, the, the, make Tottenham the best it can be, uh, you know, on all fronts. So um, it's something that we've always done as a young player. When I was a player, I remember going out into the community and meeting, meeting people, speaking to young kids. Uh, you know, it's something that players continue to do now. As an ambassador, I'm able to do it, uh, you know, on a bigger scale. Uh, but it's something that we've always, we've always you know, seen big importance in, um, you know, it's just the new stadium, for example, delivering so many opportunities for people, job opportunities for people within the community, you know, uh, thousands, thousands of job roles for, for people within the new stadium. So, you know, we're proud of, of where the club, the club is at, you know, in Tottenham and uh, yeah, we want, we want people from Tottenham to be, to be proud of the football, football team as well. Last one on, on this one is, um, how important was Harry Kane in, you know, coming to a unison agreement with the rest of the Premier League captains to, um, you know, get that players together fund for the NHS together? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure, you know, how much Harry's involved. But, you know, I think you can all tell, and myself knowing Harry, uh, you can tell what kind, of, what kind of a guy he is and what kind of yeah. character he is. You know what I mean? He, he's someone who wants to help mm. as much as possible. Um, and it's difficult as a captain, you know, I've been there, you know, trying to get everyone on board at the same time. It could be, it could be difficult. So, yeah. you know, even if there's one or two people uh, that think differently, you know, that can kind of set things back. So it can take a while for everything to kind of come around. But, you know, we, as I say, Harry's character is someone, that, um, you know, he, he is an England captain. You know, he, he will be trying to do his most for, for, for his country, just as he does as a footballer, you know, off the pitch. So, uh, you know, I'm sure, he, I'm sure he had a big role. Sweet. And, and Leather, you, you mentioned it slightly there, but um, what I wanted to ask is um, for you to shed some light into what your role is on a day-to-day -day basis now as an ambassador for, for yeah. Spurs. What, what does that entail? Right, there's, so, there's so many different, different things, you know, whether it's working with, you know, our partners and sponsors. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, the, the working with the foundation closely, going into the community, going into schools. Um, you know, just trying to uplift people in the community. Uh, you know, I'm, I grew up in Boat in East London, so I, I really understand Tottenham as an area. I understand what the young kids feel like growing up in, in, in that kind of area. Sometimes feeling that nothing good happens to you when you're from a certain area. Mm. And, you know, it's just trying to change that mindset. Um, for me, it took me seeing someone from my area in a high place that made me say, if he can do it, I can do it. And sometimes it's, it's as simple as that. And uh, you know, it's just trying to help, help, help people to, to kind of better themselves and, uh, you know, have dreams. You know, mm -hmm. It's important to have dreams and, and, and to feel that nothing can set you back if you work hard. Yeah, so Ledley, you mentioned it, you know, as a young player coming up, you were part of the famed Semrab FC. This yeah. was a youth club that's synonymous, you know, for producing young talent. We've seen John Terry, Paul Koncheski, Bobby Zamora. 
So what is it about this youth system that aids the development of young players in and around the London catchment area? Ah, do you know what? I've been, I've been asked that question a lot and it's difficult, you know. I think there was, um, there was some players before, before our group that come through. I think people like Lee Bowyer come through. Uh, I think Jonathan Fortune mm. was, at, was at Senna. But, um, I don't even know if Sol was. If Sol was at, I'm yeah. not sure if Sol was at home. Sol Alan Kerbishley. Uh, Alan Kerbishley was, yeah. Ray um, Wilkin. Wilkins, yeah. So it's always had a history. Uh, but I think for us, it was, I generally do think it was just a luck, luck, lucky group coming together at the same time. Uh, you know, myself and Jaylon Samuel, who, who played as well. Mm. You know, Bless friend, him. Right? Yeah. Good, yeah, good, good rest of his soul. Uh, you know, we grew up in, in Bowie, East London, and, and some of the other boys were in, in Essex. You know, John, John Terry, Konchesky and, and Zamora. You know, so we didn't really know each other as a, as, you know, as a group until we all come together and played. And, um, you know, I just think we, we had a lucky group. But below us was, was people like Defoe and, and uh, Leon Knight as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I just remember coming to each after our games and, and asking someone, what's the score there? And then it was like, oh, and Defoe scored five and Knight scored five. And they were just... <laughs> They were deadly, but uh, yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't, I don't know. I, I really don't know how it all, all kind of happened like that. And, and you know what, Ledley, on, on a wider um, scale, when we talk about um, grassroots football, of course, there's, a, there's, there's you know, a lot that's, that's spoken about in terms of the funding and the support that grassroots, grassroots football needs in order to keep running. And, and you know, Senrab is a perfect example of a club like, or, or, or the reason why we need to keep grassroots football going because, you know, clearly there, there's, a, there's a winning formula there. And, and so I guess what I wanted to ask is, in your opinion, what could potentially be done in order to ensure that clubs like Senrab uh, continue to get the support that they, they need to keep going? I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a really good question. I think that they, you know, there's, there's been times over the years where, you know, Senrab as a club have kind of asked, you know, for a bit of help from, from some of his former players that want to, to do well. And, uh, you know, I know that as players and as former, you know, uh, participants, I'm really happy to try and help, um, help to do that. So, um, you know, I think when you do get success and you do have players come through, you know, so I think it's important for them to kind of try and help and, and give back and keep the club running for, for, for the next generation. Hey, John, mute. I think you're, you're, you've muted yourself, mate. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, Ledley, <laughs> you're um, seen as a pillar for young players coming up in the community as someone, you know, that they want to emulate. So, apart from ability, what other three mm. minerals helped you get to, you know, the pinnacle of your career? Ooh. Good question. I think discipline is big, especially for young kids, man. Uh, yeah, we, we all grow up, we all have friends that probably, you know, don't play football and they're into other things and, um, you know, you have, to, you have to stay disciplined to try and keep on your path, you know, when, when others want to go down a different path. Um, the other thing, sometimes you need, just need good, good family men can help you do that as well. I mean, I remember there was times where I wanted to go out and play and my mum would say, you're not going out. You know, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and as kids, you don't, you don't understand it. But, you know, now I'm, I'm glad that sometimes she held me back from, from doing certain things or going certain places. Uh, you know, that's, that's important as well. That's important. So there's, there's, there's certain elements of, of luck. There's certain elements of uh, having good people around you. You know, it's, it's, as I say, it's difficult when you've got friends that, you know, and they're good friends of yours, but, you know, maybe they want to do other things that, that are not helpful to, to, to your football. Mm. And maybe that's just going out. Yeah, yeah. At a, at a young age. Uh, you know, so you need, there's a bit of luck to it, but discipline's always, always one. Um, and work uh, and desire to, to really, you might not see yourself as good enough, but if you keep working, working and keep believing, you know, I've seen so many players that have been uh, because they just had that work ethic. So, um, I don't know if you can hear me. 
Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Um, just you know, had that work ethic to to, to keep improving and, and just keep believing in themselves. So uh, you know, I think there's some of the so Lendy, um, obviously you're a Tottenham Hotspurs legend and it's very easy for me to say, you know, take us back to day one. But before we do ask that, I want to ask you, what does the football club mean to you? Um, it means a big, big deal. You know, I've been, uh, I've lost count of how many years now. You know, it's uh, over, t- over 25 years I've been in the club. Mm. So, uh, you know, obviously more than half, much more than half my life. Uh, you know, it's just, just a big part of me. You know, it's always going to be a big part of me. And, uh, you know, for me, I'm one of them people that, that when I was at Tottenham and I was a player and a captain, you know, I wanted to drive the team forward. I wanted to win things with, with, with my club. Um, you know, that was important one to me more than going some elsewhere and winning three or four uh, trophies. You know, I wanted to try and win things with my club and you know that's the kind of person I was and you know that's the kind of relationship I had with the club from from day one as a 14 year old joining joining the club. Uh, you know just I just felt at home from day one and you know, I think that's just so important for a player to, to fair play. Now support Fair, fair play. Now, now, obviously, Deadly, um, on your debut for Tottenham, uh, you injured your knee after receiving a, a tackle from Rory Delap, and I think it was like 30 seconds into the game, um, and, and you were out for six weeks as a, as a consequence. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, I know it's a bit of a, a, a morbid thought, but do, do you feel that that was almost the beginning of the end in terms of you know, uh, the, the, the issues that you had um, with, with, with yeah. your knees and, and injuries subsequently? Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't actually my debut. It was my first, it was my first start. So it's my first mm. full game. My, my yeah. debut was uh, at Anfield against Liverpool at half time. Um, mm-hmm. I remember it was against Derby. Uh, my first full start. I was playing in midfield and it wasn't even 30 seconds. It was probably 10. Three uh, uh, laps. Mm. And uh, I managed to play. I managed to play, play the game, play through the game. But it was after the game. I needed an operation, um, and it, yeah, it ended up being the knee that, that was my troubled knee in, in the end. Uh, but I don't put it down. To, I don't really put it down to, to to that. You know, I think that the fact is that I, I played through a lot of uh, damage during my career at times. Probably didn't help myself in, in that respect. Um, and I. You know, someone who played. So, uh, you know, as I say, that was my first operation on that knee, but uh, put it down to that. Yeah, so throughout your career, you were known as someone that would put in heroic performances despite your injuries. I remember a game against Liverpool at Anfield, you know, when Tottenham won 2 0, and you had Luis Suarez in your back pocket, you were out jumping Andy Carroll. (laughs) Like, how was it being as a player mentally? Because I remember during the press conferences, Harry Redknapp will come out in front of the press and they'll ask him, how's Ledley for tomorrow? And they'll be saying, oh, Ledley's done 20 minutes by himself outside. Yeah. He's a bit touch and go. So, like, if you could walk us through the mental procedures that you had to go through just to make yourself readily available. <clears throat> it was tough. It was tough because... You know, I had, I had a major operation at 26, and it was really after that my, never, my knee never felt the same. Um, so from that point on, really, I had to adapt. Uh, you know, a full process that I was never going to be the best I would have been. Um, you know, then it was just about kind of getting the most out of my career that I could, and making sure that my teammates were a better team when I was playing. Because it was easy when you're not training. If I'm going to play, we better be winning. Because otherwise, there's no point to be being, there's no point to be being around. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it, it then became about making sure that we was winning games when I was playing. Um, you know, that, funny enough, that Liverpool game that you mentioned, I've been out seven months of the season with a groin problem. My, my biggest problem was because I couldn't train. I pull muscles. 
mm. all the time. So I'd come back, play two or three games, pull another muscle out again, two or three, play two or three games, muscle, muscle. Uh, I've been out for seven months with a growing problem. And, and I wasn't, I actually, I think I had one or two training sessions, travelled with a team to Liverpool to watch the game. Yeah. And Harry pulled me an hour and a half before kickoff and said, can you play? I said, what? I said, no, oh, Harry, I can't. You know, I've, I've only had two training sessions. Yeah. And he said, we're a better team when you play, you know, come on. Can, can. And I said, all right, I'll give it a go. And, um, yeah, it was against Suarez and Carroll at the time and, and we won the game 2-0. Um, but that was me, you know. When, when I, if, if, I, if I felt I could play, I, I always played. And, you know, whether it was 60 70%, um, you know, if I felt I could help the team, I, would, I always tried to go out there. But in terms of the, how difficult it was, it was tough. Mentally, it was tough. You know, when you're not training, you know, your fitness is not there. Uh, I had to lie to myself to pretend that football was nothing to do with fitness. Wow. Yeah. You know, I had to say, this is not athletics, this is football. I know how to play football. It's not about the running. It's about the ball, being in the right place and, uh, you know, just taking care of it and being clever. So... Yeah, no, it's tough, but I, you know, I managed to get my, my, my mind around that and that helped. So what sort of mental challenges did you face? Because surely when you went onto the pitch, you felt, I have some physical limitations in, in terms of like, if I sprint, I may, yeah. you know, put on muscle. So how yeah. difficult was it to play at full throttle? Uh, when, when you're out there, you just got to kind of leave it out there and, you know, you can't, hold back. So if I had to sprint, I'd sprint. Mm. Um, and if, you know, I was going to pull a muscle, I had to pull a muscle doing it. But, you know, the biggest thing was that, you know, it's tough, it's tough when you don't trust your, when you tr don't trust your body, uh, mm. you know, you get these demons in your head that you think that you're going to pull a muscle before you even pull a muscle. <laughs> <laughs> That's the tough part. Uh, and it was just about trying to be clever. You know, I didn't want to run. I didn't want to do as much running as I did before. So then it was about, being a little bit more intelligent with my defending, uh, being a bit more clever with my, you know, my strikers, with the offside, with the offside line to stop myself from running at times. Um, but yeah, you know, it's tough, you know, when you know that you haven't put the work in during the week for train, you know, in training, mm. you, know, you have to kind of block that out. You can't, you can't turn it, you know, you can't let that get in your head. You just have to kind of block that out and get out there and, and do what you can. Fair play. Now, obviously, uh, rolling it back to um, the early years at, at, at Tottenham, um, you were deployed in uh, the sort of box-to-box -box role by George Graham. Mm. Um, what was that experience like for you? I know as a player, naturally, you'd, um, you'd, you, you, you're just happy to be on the pitch and, yeah. and, and representing your club. <clears throat> um, but at that point, did you already know that you were more uh, and better suited to playing as a, a central defender? What, what, what were the sort of the, the differences uh, in terms yeah, of... Yeah, well, I played uh, defence all my, my life at Senrad. <coughs> um, all my, all my uh, youth team career. The only time I played midfield was at school sometimes. Um, but George Grant saw me more as a midfield player than a, than a defender. Uh, so, uh, you know, at that age, when you're 18, 19, you're just happy to be on the pitch and play it. But deep down inside, I think uh, I knew that defend, you know, centre back was always my my preferred position. It was always my best position. Um, I was always confident that I would end up in my my, my favourite position. Um, but it took a while for me to actually to get around to it because even when um, after George Graham, Glenn Hoodle come in, we played three centre halves, and I played left side of the, the three centre halves. Um, and when he got the sack, David Plea took over for half the season. He put me back in midfield. And then I went to the Euros that year, 2004, and played in a back four as a centre half with Seoul against France. And um, that was the first time I played in the back four against Thierry Henry and Trezeguet. And uh, how was that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I liked it. I liked it. I felt, I felt <laughs> easier, you know. And that's and to be playing against Henri and Trezeguet for me to say it felt, felt easier is. Um, you know, it's, it's almost sounds disrespectful, but in terms of um, being a defender, it felt easier, less, you know, um, less positions to cover. Mm. You, know, you stayed central. Um, I just found it a lot easier. And really from then, I was able to go back to 
my club playing the back four for 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 a few years before the knee kind of troubled me again. But um, you know, as I say, it took me a while to actually play in a back four as a centre half. But uh, once I did, I, I just found it a lot easier. You know, I think that when you have got your full backs there and your partner, uh, you know, I just felt a lot more protected than playing in a back three where you're you know you're out on wide at times and 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 up against tricky wingers and. You know, no centre half like being near the near the by like, yeah, near the side yeah. like that. Yeah, you know, it's an uncomfortable place for us. So uh, <laughs> I was happy to be in, a, in in the middle of a back four. Yeah. So in your early days at Spurs, um, Tottenham were perennial, you know, mid-table finishers. Mm. But when Harry Redknapp came to the club, it started to seem like Tottenham could start challenging and finishing higher up in the table. Yeah. So would you say Harry Redknapp has been key in what we're seeing now for Tottenham? I think Harry's, yeah, Harry's had a big part. I think mine, you all also had a big part. Yeah, yeah. We were, you know, we, as you say, we went from a mid-table team, but then under mine, you know, we finished fifth yeah. twice. And, uh, you know, we all know the story. We went down to the last game of the season. What? Lasagna gate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think Martin really kind of took us there and then Harry took us over the line. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean, and... Uh, yeah. I must say, during that time under Harry was, uh, you know, although I was limited in what I could do, it was my favourite time in terms of the players that we had in the team and, and the football we were playing. Um, I'm just going to bring in um, a listener's question. Well, it's not really a question, but this is from At Life of TY. And it's a, not a question. Just tell him that I love him. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of love... <laughs> Tell us about your relationship with Harry Redknapp because that was that love at first sight. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think I, I think like most players, you always look at look from the outside and you see someone like a Harry and you think, yo, I'd love to play for him. So uh, you know, when he finally joined the club, it, it was great because Harry's one of them people that you know he, he just he just knows the game. Do you know what I mean? He knows he knows the game inside out. Uh, he knows a player. He knows players. He had, he had a great skill of bringing players that a lot of other clubs maybe didn't want, or you know, players that were a bit more difficult to handle. He knew how to handle them. Um, so, uh, and, and for me, I was lucky because he was a manager that allowed me to not train. And not every manager would do that. You know, not every manager. No chance. Would, you know, my career could have been over at, at, at you know twenty six, twenty seven. You know, <laughs> so. Um, you know, Harry just allowed me to kind of get on with, with my whatever I needed to get on with indoors throughout the week and just come out on the pitch and, and try and play. Um, you know, it was important, it was important, and he, and he covered the right time for me, I suppose. Maybe you made an interesting point there, and I just thought I just had to, you know, ask you another question on top of the question I asked you. But you said Harry Redknapp was great at dealing with difficult players, and on the podcast with Rio Ferdinand, we spoke in depth about Ravel Morrison. And mm. there was another player that you actually played with that was held as one of the, you know, top young English talents coming through. David Bentley. Mm. Where do you think it all went wrong for him? Because he had all the ability. He did. He did. Um, I think, I think uh, that Bentz would probably look back at now and... and you know, probably ask yourself, did he really, you know, commit, commit to it, you know, commit to, to, to everything, to football. I think Prince was always one of them players that just loved, he loved having a laugh. Mm. I mean, he just wanted to come into training every day and laugh and everything was funny to him. And, and uh, you know, I think football changed, changed a lot, kind of, you know, through the, from the late, really late 90s probably when he was a young player a very young player in a youth team or or schoolboy um, you know the players that he'd watched having a laugh the, the, Ian Wrights and probably the, the Mersons and Ray Parlers and Tony Adams and uh, you know I think he always saw football that way and you know I think he, he struggled a little bit with the change of football and how I suppose the, the microscope on football football has become you know every move that you, you made um, you know, you're in the you're in the newspaper. So, uh, you know, I think he didn't like that that element of the game. He just wanted to, to come in, have a laugh, and play football. And uh, you know, I think he fell out of love with the game a little bit because um, 
in terms of talent, he was he was definitely up there. You know what, Levy? You you mentioned um, there was a point in in your career where you had to accept that you 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 weren't going to reach the lofty heights that you had once hoped that you would, right? And and that for anybody would be really really difficult. And and so what I wanted to ask you is that you know when you hear stuff like. Um, what what Dot uh, what Dot mentioned there about like, the fan that just wanted to say how much he loved you. So knowing you're mm. so you're so loved by the, the the supporters of the club, and you know literally every everyone says it. Pundits, players, mm-hmm. fans, they all say if not for the injuries, you would have easily got, gone on to be one of the best ever uh, uh, defenders that, that England have, have produced. So what does that mean to you? Does, does that hold any sort of weight and value in, in, in terms of, you know, um, <coughs> and, and like the fact that you, you weren't able to, to, to reach that height? Does, does that sort of help soften the blow a little bit, I think? Um, I, I probably, it's, it's a bit 50-50, do you know what I mean? One part of me is, is disappointed that I had to have the injuries and I couldn't, be the, the real player that I wanted to be. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I still feel like I had so much more to give. Um, but then there's the other side that's proud because I still managed to play through something that you know, most players hate. Not you know not being able to train, you know, or coming back from an injury. They will tell you that that's that's so difficult. You know, their first few games coming back from an injury, they don't feel like themselves. So I played like that constantly, not feeling like myself for five years. Um, so to be able to deal with that gives me strength. Um, and I'm proud of that side of things. But yeah, of course, I'm a little bit, uh, the other side where you're disappointed that you couldn't really mm. you know, be the, 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 the player that, that I always felt that I could be even from a young age. Yeah, yeah so lately I want to you know, assess the state of centre-backs. You know, there's a real dearth of talent right now. Obviously, we've got Van Dijk ruling the roost. We've got Laporte, we've got Koulibaly, we've got Skriniar, who I like at Inter Milan. What do you make of the current state of centre-backs? Why are there no more top-quality <laughs> centre-backs coming through? I think, I th- I think there, are, there is, but I think the game's changed now where, you know, I think they're asked to do different things at times. And, and um, you know, for me, you you know, no matter how good you are on the ball, mm. you're always going to have to defend as a defender. You're always going to be in positions where, you, you know, you, you're going to get found out, whether that's crossing, <laughs> whether that's on crosses, you know, whether that's, um, you know, you're not, you're not getting tired enough, you're not blocking, you know. You know, there's certain elements to defending that, that you get found out if, you're not, you know, if you don't do well enough. And, uh, you know, I think the game's gone a little bit more looking for for players that are comfortable on the ball mm. and can play out from the back and, you know, hopefully they can do a bit of that defending and, you know, they can be a player. So I think it's just the way that the game's gone. But for me, <clears throat> you know, when it comes down to the real nitty gritty of, of, of football at the, the highest level, uh, you need defenders that can defend, you know. And I think, you know, you look at Real Madrid, they've got a Ramos and a, uh, a Varane that, that, that can defend. Um, you know, PSG have got Thiago. And um, you know, Marquisio can defend as well when he plays there. Uh, Liverpool, Van Dijk, Laporte. You look at Man City with company. Mm. <clears throat> Tottenham with you know Vertonghen and um, Alderweireld, and you know Sanchez can defend. You know, you just need, like him. Yeah, just need. You're gonna need. You know, at the top end of the game, you need players that can defend for sure. Yeah, Ledley. I'm always you know one to ask about mythical matchups. Last week, I asked Rio about Gerard or Lampard. <laughs> this time, I'm going to turn the screw. John Terry or Rio Ferdinand? <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. So, well, they're, they're two totally different players. Ledley, no sitting, no sitting on the bench. <laughs> You're sitting on the bench. <laughs> Listen, um, uh, let me go around the book. Sure. Like, I come to the answer, but you know, okay. this is why they they kind of was able to to, to gel so well because they're totally different. Um, but like John was underrated as a footballer. Mm. I was underrated. Definitely, definitely. Um, 
you know, obviously Rio was a little bit more cultured on the, on the ball and could come out and, you know, make things look easy. Um, and John was just everything, you know, give, give everything, you know, um, die for the cause. So they're, they're, they're a great partnership. But, you know, my style of footballer, the, the footballer that I grew up watching and trying to emulate, my hero was Maldini and Lillian Churro. Yeah, mm. I like the, the effortless, effort, effortlessness of their, <laughs> yeah. their, 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 yeah. their game. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So that that was my favourite. So you know, I suppose you have to go <clears throat> Rio with what I prefer. But you know, the next man will will say Terry. And, and to be fair, I think if you look at Terry, he's probably had the most. He's probably been the most successful defender or centre half. Um, you know, probably during the Premier League. So. You know, as I say, they, they make a, a good partnership. What led the ability wise? Do you think you're better than Rio or Terry? <coughs> mm-hmm. Ability wise, me? Yeah. How do you match yourself up to them? Do you know what? Ne- <coughs> How I answer is, I never ever, I never looked at any defender and felt mm. that they could, that I couldn't do anything they could do. Yeah. So yeah. I always felt, you know. I felt, <laughs> I'm trying to say it without sounding like um, <laughs> I, just, I just felt rounded. I felt well-rounded. I felt like I could could run, jump, play. Do you know what I mean? There's certain, you know, probably a, a mixture of the two. Mm. Um, <laughs> Come on. Come on. <laughs> you put it this way, you know, I wouldn't. Playing, playing alongside them, any of any of the defenders in the world, I don't think I would have ever felt inferior to to, to anyone. Um, you know, at, at club level, you know, playing playing with anyone. So, uh, you know, but I, so now I'm big fans of these them two guys. You know, we're all a bit of a, a community. You know, centre halves and uh, you know they they were two of the the most successful ones that, that we've had. So. You know, I don't want to look like a hater. So coming across <laughs> it, but, you know, no, Ledley, um, you know, leading to the World Cup in South Africa, I uh, remember vastly there was three players in the contention for the two centre-back spots, yourself, John and Rio. Obviously, Rio had the freak injury, you know, when Emil fell on top of him. Yeah. Going into that tournament, how were you feeling and did you think you were going to be one of the two names on the first team sheet? I tell you the truth, with England, I never really felt like I was going to be one, one of the, the the first two. Um, and under Capella, I've, ne- I've never played under Capella, to be honest. Um, so with him, I wasn't sure. You know, but before that, I never felt that I was going to be one of the two. Maybe that's because I was at Tottenham and other people were, you know, clubs that were competing for the league. Um, but under Capella, I kind of knew he was a fan because he kept trying to pick me. For, for, for years before that, but I'd, I'd always said that until I felt comfortable enough to to play a certain amount of games in a week, I wouldn't try and do it. You know, as I said before, I was breaking down with injuries after three or four games. So why did I, you know, I never wanted to go and add another England game to that. Um, but it just so happened that I, I went on a good run just before the, the World Cup. Um, it was a season we finished, we finished fourth and uh, you know, I went on a good run of games. 10, last 10, 11 games, um, played them, felt good. And then he asked me again, can I come to the World Cup? And, you know, I had to think seriously about it. And people think, ah, oh, yeah, because it's the World Cup, you jumped on it. But to be honest, I had to think seriously because I didn't want to go and be injured or get injured because I knew the backlash would be there. Right? Mm. So, but that was the first time I felt confident enough in my body that I said, you know what, I think I, think I can do this. And um, it's just it the way it happened. I played two warm-up games before the, <laughs> the World Cup. I was fine. Started the first game against uh, USA. Yeah. And uh, I think Gerard scored after five minutes. Yeah. And at just about that time, um, or maybe I think it was about a minute before, I felt my groin. And I'm like, please, no, it can't be. And um, I managed to struggle through till half time, But I knew at half time I was coming off. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, that was the, the first five minutes of, of the first game. And uh, I couldn't bear to bring myself off the pitch because I knew that people would be saying, why did you pick him? Why did you take him? Why did...? So I, I struggled through uh, the first half. You wouldn't notice. I didn't really get 
kind of tested to have to turn and sprint. I just kind of mm. um, just kind of got through the first half, but I knew I was coming off, and uh, you know, that was disappointing, really disappointing. Yeah. I think moving forward to the Spurs we see today, there was almost a transition period with AVB. Um, and then obviously it led on to the Pochettino era. But I think in between that era, I remember Gary Neville famously saying on Monday Night Football that this Spurs team, they're flaky, <laughs> they're bottlers. Yeah. What have Tottenham done to change that mentality? Because I remember a big moment, FA Cup, under Pochettino, they couldn't cross the line. Mm. Title running with Leicester, 2 0 up against Chelsea, they end up drawing 2 2. So, what is is there a mentality problem at Tottenham? Um, no, because I think that every every manager is bringing something different. Um, you know, Tottenham have always had players that play with a certain style and and try and play attractive style of football. Um, and, and sometimes you have to find that balance. And I feel that. Under uh, Pochettino, the team really had that balance. They had that, that toughness, as well as the uh, you know the attractive football that, that they were playing. And you know, really, I don't know how under under Pochettino, the club or the, you know the group of players didn't win anything. You know, they come so close on numerous occasions, and uh, you know, we're just unlucky uh, at the time. And you know, it's a it's a good question because during my time, I hated that being that, that label. You know yeah, I mean, I hated people saying that about us, but you know, probably we didn't probably do enough of the the the, the important things to to be a team that is just really difficult to be mm -hmm. defend as a team properly. Um, you know, we was more of a team that went out and expressed ourselves and played played freely. Um, and it's difficult to win like that, to play freely, you know. I think that unless you're, you know, maybe Barcelona or so, but you need, other than that, you need, um, you need the principles, you need the principles to, to go and win things. You know, we look at Man City, the season they've had and, you know, the, the players they have. But still, when it comes down to it, it's the, you know, it's the nitty gritty. And Liverpool have had that this season. They've had that, that toughness at the, at the back, uh, the kind of nucleus to allow the other players to go out and play and express themselves. And, you know, we probably lack that um, during times in my career. Yeah, so another player that's been in the headlines recently is Tangi Ndombele. You yeah. know, a 62 million euro signing from Olympic Lyonnais. Um, this was a player that during the summer, there was a lot of interest. You know, every man and their dog were being linked with him and Tottenham yeah. won the race. It's been a bit of a mixed bag season for him. He's had some games where he showed some good signs. And other yeah. times, obviously, the managers come out in the press and sort of had a go at him. I remember the game against Norwich. Yeah. When you're assessing him, as you do, yeah. on the Hotspur Way training ground, what do you see from him? And do you think he's got it in him to turn around his situation at Tottenham? I'll tell you what, I see. I see some player with unbelievable ability. Um, you're right, it has been difficult for him this season. And I think... I think it started in pre-season. You know, I think in pre-season he, he picked up an injury. He, he found the pace of the Premier League or the pace of, of English football, the training, totally different to what he was used to in France. Uh, and I think he struggled at uh, first of that and he picked up an injury. And you know, if you pick up injuries in pre-season, you, you almost play a catch-up you know, throughout the season. You can, can really interrupt. Your season, and uh, you know he's had a few injuries, and you know he keeps coming back in, and then uh, he's not playing, and it's been difficult. It's been difficult for him, but he's definitely a player of unbelievable ability. Um, you know, you don't lose that overnight, regardless. It's just it's just having to learn about the pace of the Premier League. You know, we've seen flashes of brilliance from him at times, um, and it's just about him him. You know, regaining his full fitness and being as fit as he can be, and you know, maybe maybe we're going to see that. I think even Pochettino at the time said maybe you know we're not going to see the best of him straight away. You know, and that was from an early uh, an early stage. So um, 
you know, some players take a while to adapt to the Premier League, but you know, I'm sure that you know, given a good run in the team, um, you know, you're going to see this. You know how good this player is. Certainly, um, I've been reliably informed that you have been pivotal to the emergence of the youngster Tanganga. Um, what attributes did you see in him, and do you kind of see yourself in? <laughs> No, I don't, I don't see myself. I think you're different. He's, he's not, you know, Jeff's, Jeff's not, the, not the tallest. Um, mm. He's under six foot. Um, but what, what I liked about him was that, and this it goes back to what we said about earlier, some of these young defenders, they don't really want to, do, they don't really yeah. want to defend. He likes, <laughs> he loves defending. We saw that in his debut against yeah, Liverpool, clearing one of the lines. Line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He loves it, but you know he's still got a lot of hard work to do. He's still, you know, it's early, early days for him. Um, but when I watched him, and I, you know, watched him on the training ground, and watched clips of him, I saw someone that, as a young player, had a desire to put his body on the line. Um, you know, someone who wanted to defend, enjoyed defending. And I think when you get a defender or a player, a young player with that, that's, a, that's an important trait. And, um, you know, I don't think enough, as I say, enough uh, young players actually really enjoy defending. So he was someone that stood out for me in, in, in the fact that he, he really enjoyed doing that. And, uh, you know, the hard work begins for him. It begins because, you know, we've obviously got top, top class defenders at the club and, you know, he's someone that's, that's come in. He's played numerous positions. He played every position, I think, yeah, under the sun honestly. so far. Uh, right back, left back. So, but it takes a while for you to, to, to learn and adapt. Like I said, I had to play different positions when I first come through. My debut was left back. Then I played midfield and eventually got in at centre half. And, you know, sometimes you have to do that as a young, young player. And you don't really get to see the best until you settle down and, and fully play, you know, a number of games in your best position. But, um, you know, he's definitely someone that, it's got a lot of potential. Yeah, I know we mentioned this man in passing, uh, Mauricio Pochettino, but I think, you know, it's only right that we shine a spotlight on the work he done at Tottenham, you know, overseeing the club from the old stadium to the new stadium and still consistently finishing in and around that top four. You know, when he left the club, obviously it was reported that a lot of the players went to his house. There was a lot of emotion, a lot of crying and consoling. What's your overall memory of Mauricio Pochettino and where would you rank him, you know, amongst the Tottenham great, great managers? Um, you know, for me, he was, he was most, one of the most important things was he's, um, he was just so personable. Mm. I mean, and, and I think the players obviously related to that. And, um, you know, I say he, he come across as such a nice guy, but don't forget he's South American. So he's got that tough streak in him as well. Do you know what I mean? So he, he managed to have that balance of being um, a friend, but not someone that you want to kind of let down at the same time. Um, I think that's why the players t t took to him so well. Um, and of course, you know, it's disappointing and, and sad to see him go. But, you know, when you get a chance to bring in a manager, um, you know, a manager that's done it all and won things, like Jose Mourinho, you know, you... You can't let that opportunity go by. You know, we're a club that has, <clears throat> has done everything but, you know, winning enough trophies over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. And, you know, when you get a serial winner as a manager, um, you know, they don't come along too often. So, you know, I think the time was right for us to, to bring in Joe today. And, um, you know, so far I've, I've had an opportunity to work with him. He's been, he's been unbelievable. His, his mm. attention to detail, um, I just think the difficult the difficulty is was just when the team were getting some momentum, um, you know the injuries the injuries come along and kind of kind of destroyed that. So you know I, I've got no doubt that once the team get back to to full fitness, as we're seeing, you know with Kane and and the likes of Sissoko and you know and then Bergwijn got injured right at the end as well. Yeah. Just, everything was all going wrong. But you know once the team's fully fit and. Uh, you know, the son obviously missed the number of games. Once it all comes together, you know, I mean, you, you really see, uh, you know, how good, how good this team can be. What was the reaction like um, after the Champions League final? Because for me, it seems like it kind of broke the Tottenham team. And 
personally, I don't think Mauricio Pochettino recovered after that. So did that kind of destroy the dynamic of the team because they didn't cross the line? I don't think it destroyed that. I just think it was a, it's a tough blow. Mm. This, is a, this is a group of players that had come close on a few occasions before. Um, you know, went on an unbelievable journey to actually get to the final. You know, we, mm. you know, we almost had nine lives um, getting to the final. And... Um, and the way the game panned out, it was just there for grabs, wasn't it? You know, it wasn't, you know, both teams, neither team really played well. Um, you know, the game was there there for grabs. And, you know, I just think so much energy and, you know, I just think everyone believed that it was, it, this was it. This was our time to, 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 to win something and, and win big. Ledley, was it, was it honestly like that? Because from the outside looking in, I, I was never convinced that Tottenham were actually going to win that, that, that Champions League because I felt they didn't have the mentality. Yeah, but do, you know, but do you know what it was? For me, the biggest thing was that the three weeks in between the last game of the season and, and, and the final that kind of just, I think, deflated the momentum of both teams, really. And the only difference, I think, was that Liverpool had been to a final before... Yeah knew how to deal with the game a little bit better than, than, than Tottenham. Um, and I think that was the key to it, you know. And, you know, sometimes when, when you haven't done it before, you know, you're in this big, big arena and, um, you know, you haven't done it before, you don't, you, can't, you don't deal with it as well as maybe if you've been there before and, and seen it and done it. And I think the difference on the day, you know, Liverpool just felt a little bit more comfortable and just knew how to get yeah, mm. Fair play. Now, um, Ledley, you uh, recently were asked to name your all-time Spurs starting eleven, mm. and um, you named in the left wing position a certain Gareth Bale. You obviously had uh, an opportunity to, to work with him and, and, and see him in training and, and, and play with him. And I mean, in his final season for for, for Spurs, I mean. You, you'd be hard pressed to find a better individual seat. <laughs> Literally, he was King Midas. Anything he touched was, was turned into gold in that in that final season. And and obviously he's he's gone over to um to Madrid and he's won things there. He's yeah. he's turned up on on big occasions and 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 pulled it out of the bag and and you know scored goals at you know at key moments. But there is this sentiment that you know he he he's not quite appreciated over at at, at Madrid. Um, yeah. But by, by, by the fans, it, it doesn't seem as though uh, Zidane quite fancies him. Where do you think it's gone wrong for him? Oh, yeah, you, you know, as you say, Gareth, um, he's a great lad, do you know what I mean? Gareth's one of them players who never, you know, never any bother, doesn't cause any problems, quiet. Um, and I, I don't know, he's just been kind of made a scapegoat from, from quite early on in his career over there and you know whether that's because he didn't really learn the language you know they probably felt that he wasn't committed to, to, to the team to the to the club to the country um, not sure because you know in, in terms of what he's produced on the pitch um, you know, and, he, and he's had some injuries over there but mm. you know would, <laughs> would you score a goal like he scored in, to, you know, in, a, in a camp Champions League final. Playground stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember that game against um, Inter Milan against Maicon. Like, there was the old um, taxi for Maicon. Yeah, yeah. Taxi for Maicon. Coming Icon of age performance. That, that was, that was. That, you know, we, we'd already seen it. We don't, you know, us players at Tottenham, the Tottenham fans had already seen bits and pieces of that. But that was when everyone in the world kind of sat up and said, who's this guy? Um, and he went from strength to strength from then. Do you know what I mean? But like you say, the season, his last season at the club was um, the best individual performance I've seen in, in, a, in a Spurs shirt, you know, during my time, during my, my lifetime, really. What, what he was able to do during that season was unbelievable. Yeah, so, um, Ledley, there's been obviously some outcry from the fans in terms of Enoch and Daniel Levy. Some fans say, OK, we've got the best stadium in the world. We've got the best training ground in the world, but now we want to see results on the pitch. From your discussions, I know you're very close to obviously Daniel Levy. Yeah. How determined is he 
for Tottenham to cross the line and win trophies? And do you believe Jose Mourinho will be the man to deliver those trophies? So I hope so. And, and in terms of how committed he is, he, he's so committed. You know, I think it goes back to when I was a player and we had ambitions of this new stadium. And, you know, as a player, you kind of, uh, you kind of forget about it because it's going on in the background. And, you know, to see it now, this, this unbelievable stadium that is, you know, for me, the best, best stadium in the world. Um, you know, this was his, his vision. You know, not only that, but the training ground is is unbelievable. Um, you know, this is, and if you look at the decisions he's had to make as a uh, as a chairman, you know, people said that it was harsh when he sacked Mario Mjol, or it was harsh when he sacked Harry Redknapp, harsh when he sacked Pochettino. But every decision has been made to try and win things, to get to that next level, that next step. You know, when, when, when Harry was sacked, it was because we, you know, he saw something in Pochettino that could take us on further, and, and, he, and he did. And um, you know, when Poch has been sacked, it's because you've got one of the you know, best managers uh, in history there and an opportunity to sign him. You know, and you know, he's probably aware that there was going to be some backlash from, from Pochettino leaving, but you know, it's only because... He, he wants to win things as well, that you bring in someone like a, a Jose Mourinho. So, uh, you know, I think he's been, it's been a little bit unfair, the, the criticism. You know, he's someone that's, as I say, he's always, he, even the work that the club do off the pitch, he, he's at the forefront of that. You know, the, the work, as I said, with the NHS and giving up the stadium, and this is, this is all, 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 all from him, you know. So, um, I think for me, he's, he's been brilliant for the club. You know, we've seen the club come a long, long way in the last 15, 20 years during my time. And, you know, he's, he's a big part of it. Um, we're going to bring in a listener question. Um, this is from Tapping Tobs from Tapping Football. This is a, <laughs> a season <laughs> ticket holder for um, Spurs. He's yeah. at every single a game. maniac. As, <laughs> he loves you, Ledley. He <laughs> loves you, Ledley. <laughs> he said... Who was the best player he played with during his time at Spurs? It has to be Luka Modric. Mm. <laughs> Luka was, Luka was unreal. What a player. What a player. Luka. Um, could, just couldn't get the ball off Luka. The ball was stuck to his foot. He was quicker than you thought. He could, he could roll, twist and turn and just run away from people. Mm. Um, you know, he, played, he played the ball on the outside of his foot. It was beautiful. Um, but as I said before, Gareth was the player that took his game to a whole new level. Do you know what I mean? When, when you got someone, I think in his last season, he scored nine winning goals. Do you know what I mean? When you, when you put that into points, how, much, how important that is for, for a team. Yeah. Um, you know, that level that he reached, some of the goals he was scoring as well. Um, so Gareth probably just, just nips it. But Luke, Luke was, Van der Vaart was a player. Oh, yeah. technique, man, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Defoe and Keane, Berbatov, they, 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 Teddy Sheridan, Ferdinand. I've had some, 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 some great players during my time. Um, I've been fortunate enough to play, but, you know, as I say, um, Gareth probably pips everyone in terms of, you know, what he was able to achieve. Yeah. Okay, I've got another question. Um, what is the best football match you've ever been involved in as a player? As a player, um, I, I have to say, winning, winning the Carling Cup, when we, when we won the Carling Cup, it was against Chelsea, it was a strong, strong team at the time. Um, and, you know, just having the opportunity to, to, to play at Wembley and be captain of a team that, you know, can achieve something that will, you know, be in the history of the club was, was important. Um, so I'd say that was, you know, in terms of, you know, performance, it wasn't the, the, the greatest, we played well, but it wasn't the greatest performance I've been part of, but the importance of the game was, you know, that's, that's my favourite game for sure. But, you know, beating Arsenal 5-1 is, uh, is, is very close. <laughs> Would you very happy close. about that? <laughs> <Very close. laughs> um, I've got one for you, Lindsay. Um, hmm. I, 
the initial question I want to ask you, I know you're going to sit on the fence on, so I'm going to make it easier for you, right? Yeah. You've had a chance to play with Robbie Keane, Jermaine yeah. Defoe, yeah. Teddy Sheringham, Les Ferdinand, Dimitar Berbatov, right? Five yeah. top, top, top centre yeah. forwards. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you could, let's assume you're, you're, you're playing a game, right? And you could create a, <laughs> a, 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 a centre forward taking one quality from each of those five players, yeah. what would be the quality that you take from each of them? Ooh, that's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> um, so, I take like Les's, it's just his power. And, and his, big up Les. <laughs> big up Les. His, <laughs> his, leaping, his leaping ability. I mean, Les was... This was about six foot, six foot one, but he had such a spring on him. He had such a spring on him. Um, it's a powerful when he, when he got running with a ball. Mm. Uh, I'll take the first finish in. Yeah. Bad so lethal. Um, Robbie's movement. Mm. He had a movement, Kino, very clever, clever player. I'll take and similar in terms of they both had unbelievable touches, unbelievable touches. Um, but I'm gonna have to take Berbatov's touch. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. He used to plot things out. In, yeah. yeah, I know. Put <laughs> <What, laughs> a mass to sleep with that touch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll take Teddy's um, mentality. Mm. Mm. His mentality, because he. he do you know what I take? I'm just going to change that. I'm going to take his. Um, I don't even know if it's a, if it's a thing, but he, he's, he was just a clever player. Do you know what I mean? He knew, Hello, he knew how to create space. Not in terms of Robbie was a little bit more dynamic with his movement. Hmm. Uh, Teddy was just would just pull off into little holes and just drag people out, and um, you know the ball would come to him and he'd let someone. But he just saw the game. He just read, read the game really well. Man. So. Uh, I'd be, one, I'd be one hell of a player, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> how, can you have, how can you have Berbatov's touch and lose his power? <laughs> Joking. Faking it. Stop putting defenders to sleep. <laughs> Lenny, you'll just be falling down. Like, no. <laughs> no chance, mate. No chance. <laughs> yeah, so Ledley, you've played, you know, against some of the top Premier League strikers. Thierry Henry famously came out and said that you know, you're one of the toughest competitors he's played against, that you're the only defender that can play against him properly and win the ball. Mm. As I mentioned earlier, you also played against Luis Suarez, who he was still a bit raw then. I think mm. it was a season or two after where he shot to prominence. Mm. Out of these two strikers, who do you think was the hardest to deal with? Henri. Henri. Without a doubt, yeah. Um, what was it about like Henri that made him special and how did you approach those games mentally? So like the night before where you're thinking, you know what, I need to get a good night's sleep here. I need to be on my metal before I come up against him. Yeah, oh, without a doubt, you know, it, the, the, it, was, it was scary going to bed at night <laughs> thinking about what can happen. Do you know what I mean? If you don't play well, if you don't play well, you, you're going to get punished. You could, look, you could look silly if you don't play well. Um, Henri, for me, I would say that the most difficult players are players that don't, they don't play up against you. Hmm. So, you know, if Henri was just someone who played right in front of me the whole time, then that's fine. You know, I, I fancy myself in that kind of one-on-one -on -one battle. But when someone drifts around the pitch and goes in places that you can't go to, gets up ahead of steam, you know, coming in, um, you know, could score from 30 yards by curling one in, you know, he's, he's a player that you need all your team to be playing at a very high level to stop him. Do you know what I mean? Because, you know, it doesn't matter how, sometimes how well you play. When someone's got that, that much quality, you know, they'll go elsewhere and, and punish someone else and win the game. Mm. So, uh, 
You know, that's like Messi, that's like Ronaldo. You know, you can't pin these players down. You can't pin them down. And that's what, what made him so difficult. You know, I, I think someone said I played against him 10 times. He scored twice, right? I remember the two goals well, you know, really well. One of them, he run the whole length of the pitch. Um, and I was the last man you beat, I think, in that. Yeah, I saw that, Ledley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, We're struggling there, Ledley. <laughs> listen, that, that, that is, on, once he's in full flow, um, yeah, it was a problem. You, you got to stop him early, man. We, we should have took him out at the edge of his own box and, and cut that out. Uh, another one uh, was across in the six-yard box and he, and he got in front of me. So I, I remember these things. When I, when I play against the, the, the top players, I remember what happened, what I should have done better. Um, but yeah, he, you know, he, he was someone that could, could punish you from, from anywhere on the pitch. So, Ledley, um, final one for me. Um, this is not a question, but this is another um, tweet from at Anthony Suffolk. And he said, not a question. Just tell him, in my opinion, he's the best centre-half of his generation. Mm. Speaking of generations... Who would you say are the best five defenders to play in the Premier League? And would you ever consider going into, you know, some sort of form of coaching, maybe being a defensive coach? Um, I'll start with the, the, the last question first. Um, yeah, I've been, do, I've been doing a little bit at the moment. I've been, um, you know, trying to help out as I can, you know, especially with the young players coming through. Um, been trying to do some one-on-one -on -one work with them. It's something that I quite like. Um, you know, putting, you know, whether it's a def young defender aside and, and watching clips with him and saying, you know, if you do this and do that, this will help. And then going on the pitch and maybe spending 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes out there with him on his game. Um, so it's definitely something that, that I'm enjoying doing at the moment. Um, in terms of the five players, oh, um, Rio, uh, Terry, um, Sol, uh, Vidic had a big impact. And we've got one more to. to yeah, we'll do. put yourself. We'll put you. That's good. We'll take that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, go on. Karen <laughs> 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 well, well, had a. Big career at Liverpool, didn't he? Uh, as a centre half, um, yeah. So it's tough. That was, I saw last. I think Stam. He played in the Premier League, of course. Adams, Tony Adams, mm -hmm. played in the Premier League. But yeah. I'm more going maybe a little bit more during my kind of during yeah, my time. Of course. Honestly, where where has the time gone, yeah, Leslie? Yeah, man, yeah. Um, it's it's, it's, it's been it's yeah. been such <laughs> a pleasure <laughs> chatting with you, man. It's yeah. It's just, no, no it's surreal. Like, yeah. we have to be honest, when we get the opportunity to talk to legends that we've grown up watching on our streets yeah. and actually having, you know, an hour of your time being able to pick your, your brain, it's an absolute privilege and it's something we don't take for granted on this platform. Uh, yeah, so Abs yeah, absolutely. I appreciate, appreciate what you guys are doing, man. And I uh, want to wish you good luck for the future. Keep working hard and, uh, you know, I'll be looking out. So keep going. No, I'd love, love for that, Lenny. Much appreciated, Lenny, man. So, listeners and viewers, thank you very much for uh, tuning in up until this point. We're going to call it a day there, but just wanted to remind you, if you're not yet um, subscribed to the YouTube channel, make sure you do. Also, make sure you like, uh, comment or whatever. Uh, share your feedback. Um, I know you guys sent in your questions. We weren't able to answer all of them, but we tried as best as we could. Um, also, a reminder that you can listen to all of our episodes. So I know we only uh, fairly recently started our YouTube, but all of um, our previous episodes are on Spotify, on SoundCloud, um, and on Apple Podcasts as well. And if you are listening in on Apple Podcasts, please make sure you also leave a five-star review. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure chopping it up with uh, with with uh, a legend, legend, man. Legend, a legend yeah. <laughs> um, we hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we did. It was it was absolutely fantastic. Um, also, a reminder before we sign out: um, if you're not yet following us on Twitter, it's at podcast underscore tbg, and you can also follow us on Instagram at pod underscore tbg. We've got some more things coming, guys. Stay tuned. Stay locked in. 
Until the next episode, over and out. Peace.